Okay, so here we go. All right, so here's our agenda today, building bridges, strengthening community connections through library resources. Okay, so why a library connection? Um, a lot of us on this uh, town hall today are veteran raising a reader coordinators and implementers, but also there's a healthy amount of us who are new to raising a reader, who are new to the classic red book bag model, who are new to some of our home library programs. So let's just spend a little tiny bit of time talking about why a library connection. So when raising a reader, uh, when our programs are designed, you know, the library really helps provide children and families with a way to sustain the habits that you all have spent so much time helping to craft and being so diligent with families in helping to create. We wanted to be intentional about, um, you know, when those red book bags are going home on a weekly basis with those families they are creating routines and all of a sudden now the raising a reader red book bag classic red book bag program is ending and we want families to continue on with those routines or if you have a home library program those um blue drawstring backpacks are going into the home and we want a way for those families to continue on maybe building their home libraries or having a way to meaningful mm -hmm. meaningfully connect with the community and library so sustaining those shared reading routines and those behaviors that you have so, um, you know, worked so diligently to help create, providing an avenue for librarian outreach. So not only is this beneficial for your families and your programs, but librarians, whether it's a school librarian, whether it's the community librarian or regional librarian, they often find just as beneficial for them because it's not only helping provide an increase in circulation numbers, but it's providing, uh, it's providing those libraries and uh, the librarians a way to have additional outreach. They have goals, they have priorities, they have so many site visits that they often have to do every single year. We're developing the next generation of libraries. We want to continue having kiddos and, attending, and generations going in, yeah, because in the library. Even the snap, the snap thing, year. it is in the text. I mean, it's- And if you- Okay, there we go. And if you are doing the classic red book bag program, a blue library bag is ideally given to every child one time in their participation in the classic red book bag program. They don't need to get it every single year. They don't need a whole collection if they're in the red book bag pro, uh, classic red book bag model for five years. They don't need five of them. They need it one time within their participation of the program. Oftentimes it's in their last and culminating year as a bridge to the next program that they're going. So if they're in the program from infancy all the way to pre-K, oftentimes they'll get it in their pre-K year as they then venture on to kindergarten or beyond. So again, we've talked about the sustainability, but also they're blue. They're like this deep blue or bright blue for a reason. It's that visual cue. It's that reminder so that when you see that blue bag, maybe it's hanging on a doorknob or maybe it's somewhere in the home. It's that, oh, oh yeah, we haven't been to the library this month. Let's go to the library. And then when you are going to the library and you're taking your blue bag, you know, you're taking this blue bag to the library. It's that visual cue for the librarians. Oh, that's a Raising a Reader family. I've been to that site. They must be from that local elementary school or the local Head Start site or maybe the local child care program or Miss Dolly's daycare. I'm going to go greet them. They're, they're a really important family. That's a really important site to us. Oh, hello, Smith family. Hello, Delgado family. How are you? Let me show you around. It's that positive reinforcement because remember, reinforcement is what helps change and shape behavior. And when that family's getting reinforcement from the community, that's really going to help enforce those habits, reinforce the habits that the family is uh, creating. You can connect with the, uh, the to the library's summer reading program or the Bookmobile summer reading program. Um, the capturing the attention of the local librarians I just um, I just mentioned. School librarians also really love the blue library bags. Um, I have heard many, many stories uh, about school libraries not really wanting the youngest kiddos to take those uh, checkout books. 
um, especially in my home state um, on the East Coast, because they're worried that the children don't know how to take care of them. And one thing about the classic red book bag program is that's what we instill. And if you've attended our coordinator training, we talk a lot about having the kiddos meticulously and methodically taking care of these books. And so when the children get the blue library bag, the librarians are like, there's a sigh of relief because not only do the children know how to take care of the books, but they're now putting the books into a special container, that blue library bag. Now they're putting the blue library bag into their backpacks and they're a little bit more safe rather than the kindergartners and the first graders or the pre-K and the kindergarten don't yet get to take the books from the uh, lib school library home. So school librarians oftentimes really love that the Raising a Reader kiddos get a blue library bag. So there's all kinds of great reasons for the library connection and the blue library bags, but the most important is really connecting for community resources to sustain the library. And not only for the library um, itself, but what other community resources can be included in that library connection. Sometimes it is um, bookmobiles. So here in Maryland, we have the Maryland Book Bank and the Maryland Book Bank has a bookmobile that is sponsored by the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and so that bookmobile, you can schedule it to come around. And I know there are several of our affiliates around. Um, there's Gus the Bus uh, that was in Virginia that was a Raising a Reader program. There's the Apache Junction Library that has a bookmobile. There's one in Colorado that's a Raising a Reader affiliate that had one once upon a time. That counts. That is your community connection. So it can be that bookmobile. It can be the book bank. It can be something like a little free library. It can be any of these community resources because they are meant to, even if they're not a traditional library, it's about connecting families to community resources so they can build their home libraries, so they can uh, sustain their reading routine, so they can continue increasing the intrinsic motivation of our kiddos. We want kiddos to have that fire in their bellies, that love for reading. And it doesn't matter where they're getting these uh, books from, wherever you're connecting families to a sustainability component. So the ongoing motivation is not only for the kiddos, but it's for the families. So with that, um, I'm really excited today to share with you um, one community resource uh, that we have been um, talking to for quite some time now, and that is the Little Free Library. So I'm going to ask our friends from Little Free Library to show their screens and unmute, and they're going to share about uh, their program. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. My name is Talia Miracle. Um, I'm a program manager at Little Free Library, and I'm here with one of my colleagues. Hi everyone, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Lexi Neely, I'm also a program manager. Um, and we're here today to tell you a little bit more about Little Free Library. Um, Rebecca, if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, we're a nonprofit organization and we are located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, our mission is to build community, inspire readers and expand book access. Um, our vision is a little free library in every community and a book for every reader. Um, we believe that all people are empowered when the opportunity to discover a personally relevant book is re to read is not limited by time, space, or privilege. Um, and our mission is to be a catalyst for building community, inspiring readers, and expanding book access for all through a global network of volunteer-led Little Free Library book exchange boxes. Um, and we achieve our mission and our vision by providing 24 seven book access, uh, fostering new Little Free Libraries, granting Little Free Libraries to high need areas, uh, championing, championing diverse books and working with key community partners. Uh, next slide. So you'll hear us talk a lot about Little Free Library stewards. Um, so for some background, a Little Free Library steward is a volunteer. They can be an individual, a small group, an organization, um, and they're part of our global network of stewards that maintain maybe an individual Little Free Library that's in their front yard, or maybe they maintain a small network of 10 or 12 or 15 in a community 
um, as an organization, for example, they are responsible for engaging with their neighborhoods. You know, even if a little free library is installed in someone's front yard, it's a community resource. Uh, we really encourage our steward to chat with folks when they stop by, um, to consider hosting events such as a ribbon cutting to invite the community to check out the library and learn about it. Uh, some folks do story times, which is a lot of fun with kids and families in their community. There's, you know, the ideas are endless and our stewards are an extremely creative bunch. Um, so they get really, um, they get really creative when it comes to finding ways to connect with their immediate hyper-local community, you know, on their block, in their neighborhood. And also, you know, some folks are doing outreach to their whole city or their whole county. Um, stewards are also responsible for book sourcing. So they are keeping the library stocked with great books. They're again, connecting with the community. So the community is well-educated on the idea of exchange, the goal of exchange, of course, it takes time for that exchange to get established, um, especially in areas where there is really high book need, really limited book access. That exchange might be much slower or maybe non-existent because families are seeing this great resource. They're taking books home and falling in love, building their home libraries. Um, and so the stewards who are in really high book need areas are often having to get creative again to keep their libraries stocked. You know, sometimes they work with book banks, they work connect with their public libraries. Um, some folks purchase books to share in their little free libraries. There's lots of different ways to keep that book flow going. And our goal is always, you know, we're infusing communities with books. So we are reaching a threshold that every family has enough books in the home that that exchange begins to happen. Um, it's not so much of a scarcity mindset, it's a shared mindset. And our stewards are also responsible for maintenance of the library, so keeping them in good working condition, making sure they're safe and accessible for visitors. Um, and, you know, there are times when a steward may move um, and they don't take their library with them. So perhaps the next home or homeowner will take on stewardship of the library or maybe a neighbor will say, hey, I'm going to pick up where they left off um, and I want to keep this going for our community. So stewardship often changes hands. Um, in order to keep libraries successful long-term. Okay, so next we are going to share a little bit more about our programs. Um, so the first program that we're gonna talk about is our impact library program. Um, so through this program, we provide no cost little free library book exchanges to communities where books are scarce. Um, so this program has been around since 2016. Uh, since then, we've granted over 1500 libraries across the US and Canada. Um, and 93% of our program participants say that their libraries are in communities where book access is either somewhat or very limited. Um, so through this program, we focus on granting packages to communities where book access is scarce, um, literacy resources are really limited. I often hear from people that, you know, they, that their library closed during COVID and it never reopened, um, or that their library is, you know, miles and miles away. They have a lot of residents in their area that don't have transportation to get to the library. Um, a lot of people don't have home libraries, so there's just, there's not a lot of access, um, and especially like for families and for children. Um, so these people are living in book deserts, and we define that um, as areas where the likelihood of having more than 100 books in the home is least likely. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Unite for Literacy, but they have a book desert map and that's um, what we use to determine this factor. Um, so we provide um, focus on the book desert areas. Um, we work in urban, suburban, um, and rural communities. We work with all ages. We work with all types of partners through the IMPACT program. Um, you can apply to the program as an individual. 
you can apply as an organization. Um, so we work with a lot of schools. We work with, you know, like the local post office, um, just neighbors who really want to bring more book access into their communities. And so it's a very diverse program. Um, so we review these applications on a monthly basis. Um, we have the application always available on the LFL website. Um, and then the package for the impact program contains a pre-assembled library. Um, you also get an installation option. So you can choose to put your library either inside or outside, whatever works best for you. Um, you also get a charter sign and that kind of brings you into the Little Free Library Network officially. And then you also get a bundle of 25 books to start out your library. Um, and these are really, really great books. So Lexi actually is the one to pick out the books for most of our programs. Um, and she works with a diverse books advisory group and they're just really, really great titles. Um, so we're proud of all of the books that we provide through Little Free Library. And then now Lexi's gonna share a little bit more about um, reading color. So Reading Color um, distributes diverse books that provide pr perspectives on racism, social justice. We celebrate BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and other marginalized voices. And we incorporate experiences from all identities for all readers. Um, and we do that with the help of our diverse books advisory group that Talia mentioned. Um, we work with a really wonderful group every year. We come together to talk about what's newly published, um, that we should be adding to these lists to recommend. Um, you know, some of the, the old great favorite books that are still relevant and beloved today that fit well into these categories um, to recommend and remind people this great book that came out 20 years ago that's, you know, maybe more readily available than some of the new hot popular books. Um, we try to keep um, as many, as many different titles that are have a variety of availability um, that we recommend for our Reading Color program. Reading Color began in 2020 in uh, Minneapolis, and to date we have launched in 18 different cities in the United States. We've granted over 200 libraries and distributed over 50,000 diverse books. Uh, this program is centered on working with community partners. So um, where the impact program, for example, we do work with some organizational partners. Many of our recipients are individuals. Um, with Reading Color, we're working kind of within a cohort model where twice a year, we're reviewing applications from organizations that are interested in installing between five and 10 little free libraries. So kind of those small community-based networks that I mentioned earlier. Um, we are choosing typically three cohort members um, per cohort. And then we're working together over a span of six months to roll out the Reading Color program in their community. Again, installing five to 10 little free libraries, flooding them with great, diverse, high quality books. Um, we have community celebrations to launch the program. And um, that cohort experience allows our partners who are typically scattered kind of across the country, represent very different organizations from you know, something like United Way, which is a bit more formalized, larger, um, has a lot of infrastructure to micro organizations that are maybe run by one or two people. Um, and so in the cohort experience, they get to lean on one another, share ideas, we, we troubleshoot issues together, we celebrate our triumphs together. And it has been a really wonderful way to implement this program with those small micro networks across the country. So we're currently in our second cohort cycle um, this spring, and we will be opening up applications for our fall cohort cycle on April 1st. Um, if you are interested in learning more about what this might look like for your organization, and if you might be a good fit for our cohort, um, we've got information available on our website, and I will drop a link in the chat in just a moment. Um, but yeah, this is, the Reading Color program was kind of the, the basis for establishing um, this recommended reading diverse books list um, for our program. And now we use it as the basis for any books that we distribute to try to uh, make sure that we're sharing books that read and affirm all kinds of readers from all different life experiences. 
And then Talia is going to tell you about our other central program, um, the Indigenous Library Program. So uh, the Indigenous Library Program is also our newest program. Uh, we launched just last year in June. Um, so it has been really exciting to kind of get through the first not even full year of this program. There's been a lot of excitement around it. Um, and so now we are kind of just like growing the program even more in 24, just to see um, how much more book access we can provide to indigenous communities. Um, this program is similar to the impact program and that we really are focusing on areas where book access is lacking. Um, this program, however, we work um, exclusively with indigenous communities. Um, so that could be, you know, an indigenous community living on a reservation, off of a reservation, um, an organization that serves indigenous communities, um, or otherwise an individual that has a really strong tie to one of these communities. Um, so we know that book access can be extremely limited for indigenous people, um, and that indigenous and native representation in books is severely lacking. Um, so with this program, similar to the impact program, we provide um, the choice of a library model and installation options. You also get that charter sign, free shipping, and then this program also provides two sets of books. So you get that first set, which comes with the diverse titles, and then a second set is one that's um, either written by Indigenous authors or it centers the Indigenous experience and really celebrates the culture. Um, so this program is hopefully granting 100 packages in 2024. Um, in 23, we started out with granting 50 packages. Um, something else that makes this program really special is that um, it's really focused on building relationships. Um, so I also work with uh, an Indigenous advisory group to kind of help me make decisions on the program, to help me review applications. Um, and then just really getting to know a little bit more about the stewards who apply to the program and who receive a library. Um, and it's just also uh, very culturally responsive. So those two elements, um, I think are kind of the basis of this program and what makes it really important. And um, this application is also on the website and either Lexi or I will also put a link to the application in the chat. Um, but that is kind of just a very quick run through of our programs. And then lastly, we just have a couple of different ways that we wanted to share with you all about how to get involved with the Little Free Library organization. Um, so you can start your own Little Free Library. Um, you can also support a Little Free Library in your community with Team LFL. Uh, Team LFL is our volunteer arm, and this also just recently launched. Um, so we have um, a volunteer hub that you can visit online, and you can see where there are currently opportunities available in your area. Um, and you can also share books with Little Free Libraries. Um, Little Free Libraries are open, like we said, 24-7. They are open to everyone. You can always drop a book and visit a library. Um, and we also have a mobile app. Uh, with the app, it's kind of cool. You can look in and see where there are little free libraries around your area. Um, and then stewards can also set indicators on the app. So let's say their library is completely empty. They can turn on an indicator that says needs books, um, which then if you have an abundance of books, you can see where those are needed and you can go visit that library and drop those in. Um, and then lastly, you can also apply to our programs. So on our very last slide, Lexi and I have our contact information on there. Um, please feel free to email us if you have any questions about anything we talked about. Um, and also, I believe right now we have a little bit of time for questions. Is that correct, Rebecca? Yeah, that's correct. So anyone, you can um, put your question in the chat. You can use your hand emoji and we can call on you. Uh, couple different ways to ask questions. So I've got everyone's name up here. So you can feel free, put it in the chat or just raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can unmute.
we shared a whole lot of information and there are lots and lots of ways to get involved with Little Free Library. So take some time to absorb, to think about what might be the right fit for you and know that there is room kind of for everyone in every situation to get connected with us. So if you have, you know, questions about, you know, even if you're someone who can't host a little free library or isn't interested in putting one up, uh, we have Team LFL, for example, is a great option for getting involved without having to commit to installing something in your front yard. Definitely. Thank you. And we'll, we can add this information into our um, April. April 1st is the launch uh, for the application for Reading Color. Is that right? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. We can um, put that into our April bookmark. And I think Mary Dennison from Reading Ready Pittsburgh has a question. Yeah. Hello. I love what you do. And um, I had, I honestly had no idea that there was like a national organization that did this. And I just saw these random little libraries and we started doing it and, and built our own. We have about, um, I think we have about 13 in the low income communities where we work. I'm, I'm wondering about um, rogue people like uh, Reading Ready Pittsburgh who have our own, they're not like official little free libraries. Is there a way for us to partner? I mean, I know we stole your idea and, um, but is there a way to partner on some level even though we're not official? Kelly, would you like to take that or should I? Um, sure, well, Mary, Thank you for your interest. You didn't steal our idea. You're just like operating in the same wavelength, just unofficially. Um, so there are a couple different things you can do um, if you would like to be officially connected to the Little Free Library organization. Um, you can get a charter sign for your library um, and that would make you an official steward. We do offer some resources that are only for stewards. So for example, um, we often partner with book publishers and do giveaways. Um, and those are only open to our stewards. They happen regularly uh, every single month. Um, and then we also have some more book resources on our website. So we have something called the book directory. It's also only available to stewards. Um, it's kind of an online place where if people have an abundance of books or like if publishers have books they wanna give away, they'll put it on the directory. Um, and so you can request those books. They're all on there for free. Um, so that's just a little bit of the perks of being a steward. We also have um, a private Facebook group where you just can like get a lot of inspiration from other stewards. There's a lot of like questions being answered there. There's troubleshooting happening. Um, I think it's a really happy little corner of the internet. Um, and then- is, is there a fee oh, go ahead. for that? There is an option to apply for a free charter sign. So if you want that link, you would just have to email me or Lexi and we could send that link to you. Um, Lexi, what I know there's so many ways to get involved. So what else? What else? Yeah, you, say? you know, I think as an organization, we are obviously um, directing our resources to folks who are part of our network in an official capacity. So that registration is really key for us. Um, it helps us know who we're working with and working for. Um, and it also tells us a lot about how little libraries are distributed across the country and across the world. So we get a better understanding of what the impact is of these little libraries and communities. There are so, so many out in the world that are not connected to our organization and we love them. We are so grateful that this is an idea that took off and people are taking the initiative to share resources in their communities. Um, but there are, you know, like Talia mentioned, the perks to getting involved with us to officially chartering your library. A big one is our world map. Only officially chartered little free libraries can go on our map. And that allows visitors to find your library, to visit it, to contribute to it. Um, and that is linked in with a lot of different uh, really fun functions in our mobile app. So just some things to consider if you have a little free library or if there's one in your area that is maybe a rogue library um and if you're all, if you ever wonder like 
I wonder why that doesn't have a sign on it or why that's not part of the program. It's, you know, it's because people do this on their own organically. Um, and we just try to bring as many people into the fold as possible. Great question, Mary. Sounds like a few people had the same one. Thanks for asking. Any other questions for Lexi and Talia? Okay. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you for having to us. Have you. I can't wait to provide this uh, information to the broader network as well in our monthly bookmark. And this is also recorded for those who can't join us live. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Amazing. Great. So we are also going to take this locally and see how um, Raising Reader affiliates also bring the library connection to their local community. So I, with that, I'm going to introduce everyone to Megan Chips from Reading Ready Pittsburgh. And Megan, I will go ahead and advance the slides. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we had a little change of plans, so thanks so much. Uh, my name is um, Megan Chips, and I am from Reading Ready Pittsburgh, and Mary Dedison, who just asked the question, is also from Reading Ready Pittsburgh, so yes, you are hearing about both of us. Um, so we're excited to come on today and talk about um, a little bit about what our work in Pittsburgh and um, about how we can help you guys and give some suggestions of um, beginning that library connection and uh, maintaining it. Could you go to the next slide? Okay, so just a couple of things we're gonna talk about is give you some information about our programs. We're gonna talk specifically about our upcoming blue bag events. And I know Rebecca touched on that a little prior, but I um, wanted to share how our library connection is working with the blue bag events. Um, we're gonna talk about, give some strategies for everyone to use to build some library partnerships. And then also um, once you build those partnerships, how do you maintain them? What are some ways that you can keep the momentum going? Um, next slide. All right, so just a little bit about Reading Ready Pittsburgh. Um, so we um, work to support families and um, early childhood educators by providing access to books. So we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. So we work to help enroll families to receive um, a book by mail um, each month until they turn five. Um, we also, as the Mary has uh, told everyone, we have little giveaway libraries in the area. Um, and we have, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, is our new free bookstore. Um, we also do a lot of education and training with um, early childhood professionals, um, offering continuing ed credits. Um, our new um, initiative this year is to branch into kindergarten readiness. So we actually worked with another local nonprofit um, just this week and held a kindergarten readiness skills workshop um, in our free bookstore. Um, so that was awesome to have parents um, take advantage of those uh, workshops. And then we also work to just in, um, engage the public in um, awareness around early, early literacy. Um, we often talk about helping families understand the why. Why should we be reading books? Why is this important? So we really try to um, get that family engagement um, of not just telling people you should do this, but like, why is it good? Why why are these good habits help, helpful as our child moves into um, elementary school and school readiness? Um, could you go to the next slide? All right, so this is our um, exciting new um, branch of Reading Ready Pittsburgh is we opened a uh, brand new free children's bookstore. Um, it's called B is for Books. Um, we're located in Homestead, um, Pennsylvania. So it's outside of the uh, Pittsburgh uh, city. Um, and if many, if anyone has ever traveled to Pittsburgh, we're close to Kennywood. So that's the big amusement park over this way. So if anyone's familiar with that um, amusement park. Um, the bookstore just opened in February. We're serving families in the Mon Valley area of Pittsburgh um, and the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we are um, having families come and visit. They can shop and pick three books um, each visit um, per child. We have grandmothers coming in um, saying, hey, I really appreciate you as a resource. I had my grandkids over and didn't have any books to read them um, before bed when they slept over. So we're, we're really being um, uh, 
a, a, a resource for the community, for, um, you know, grandparents, parents, um, educators, um, a, a program of the bookstore that we um, are starting as well is the teacher book request. So we're, we're uh, uh, alerting the local school districts, child care centers, um, home visiting groups, anyone that we could think of, family centers, um, that they can, as an educator, request books, a mixture of new and gently used books from us. And um, Kathy, who's on the call as well, she is our contact person and she, she's waving. Um, she assembles all the boxes with love and care and um, tries to meet, if it's a toddler request, a picture book request, to meet with the family, or I'm sorry, what the educator's needs are. Um, so we're gonna see a little tour of the bookstore if the next slide works. So we'll see. And maybe it's not. That's okay. Can you go to the next one? Oh, oh, it's loading. Okay. You want to click on it, see if it will play? Oh, that's okay. This this will just it was supposed to be a little 10 second video and walking you through the story. That's totally fine. No worries. Um, if you, could you go back one? That's okay. Um, so just a picture of the welcoming space. So we have a uh, family friendly area. So when you come in, you um, see our mural and we have um, to encourage that family shared reading. We have the reading nook. Uh, we have a cozy um, chair to hold your little one and cut up and read. And then we have all kinds of bookshelves with picture books and all kinds of variety um, of topics um, throughout the area. Um, so we're pretty uh, excited that this is a great public space. Um, if we also are working with our local child cares who, who are walkable distance, they have come um, for story time. Um, we have several early head starts who have their play group. Um, we just had one last week that came and held their um, their monthly socialization in the store, and we have another one coming next week. So it's we're really excited to share this um, with the community um, and having um, just the uh, families who walk by come in and say, hey, we're really glad you're here. Come in and do shopping. It's been amazing. Um, so if you, um, I'll share our web address at the end. Um, if you want to take a look at all of our resources, um, you can see about the bookstore on our website. So the next uh, slide is just talking a little bit about our Raising a Reader program. Um, so right now, we have had a lot of growth uh, for our Raising a Reader program. So we are in 40 sites. That is uh, 60 classrooms and about 20 home visitor caseloads. Um, so that's a variety of, you know, the early head starts where you have the, the babies um, all the way up until uh, we have um, two um, school age, um, special um, private school um, classrooms that are, on, are, are, are working with us as well. Um, we have about 920 kids enrolled in the program and they just love their red bags. We, it's, it, I, I'm sure you guys have all had people call it different things, but for us right now, it's you're the red bag people, right? <laughs> so it's been going um, very well and it's, uh, we're, we're having a lot of great engagement. Would you go to the next one? Um, so this year, we're actually working on planning all of our events right now. So right now is a perfect time if you haven't planned your blue bag event. Um, our sites are over many different um, libraries and different communities. So right now I'm working with seven librarians to um, schedule blue bag events. So the biggest part is trying to get a date that they are able to come to the classroom. I have some librarians so thankful that I reached out that they have not had um, since COVID a chance to connect back with the classroom. So that's a big part of why it's important, you know, we work to connect the classrooms to um, the libraries. Um, we're anticipating um, that we're going to, last year we had several that had library card signups the, on the day that they were able to sign families up for their card. Um, so we're hoping that we can do that again. Um, and then we actually have a few that we're going to make um, their field trip to our free bookstore and have their blue bag event in our store. So we're very excited um, that we can provide that for families as well. Um, would you go to the next slide? 
All right, so here's some of the things that we've done in the past for our blue bag and library connection. So I thought that this would be a great way just to show the engagement around it. Um, so our first slide here, this was a um, class that actually was able to make the field trip to the library. Um, we have several classrooms that are in walking distance to the Homestead Library, as well as um, we have some in, in Clarendon and McKeesport um, area of Pittsburgh that can walk to the library. So we're um, hoping to again, have some of those library um, field trips. Uh, it, it was amazing when we had this uh, blue bag event, we were talking about how many kids come and visit and they really, this was for some of them as their first time there and, and it's walkable from school. So we were excited that we could get the kids excited um, you know, enthusiastic about going to the library. Um, as you can see, we have the blue bags. We, um, the way we have run our blue bags is that we um, have a book about going to the library. If it's Library Line or Pete the Cat Goes to the Library or different things, you know, different books like that, that we insert with um, the information about getting library cards. And we also um, ask the librarians if, because we'll have it in May, if they have any of their summer programming that we can share with families before the school year is over. Um, we had, um, at this time, that we a lot of the librarians hadn't um, connected back to the classroom, and we were their first time. So the one in the middle, that was her first time in that classroom since COVID. So we were pretty excited that we could help, um, you know, bridge that gap. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so... Um, I, I thought that this would be a great way to show some of the different varieties of how the um, blue bags have worked for us. Um, the little teddy bear in the middle. Um, so we were talking about building on that um, library connection. So we had partnered um, this past year um, that if a child brought their blue bag to one of the libraries we had partnered with, they could get a little reading buddy. So the little teddy bear was our reading buddy. And if they went to the... Um, library and stand they said hey here's my blue bag they could um then get their little buddy we're hoping we'll have a, a great response this year we have several um, new sites that said yes we'd love to be part of this so um we're hoping and his little shirt says have you read a book today um so it's just a little reminder um for families that when he goes home um for them to read together um at we've had um several um because may is such a lovely weather, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, we had several sites that did it outside. Um, this one, you can tell we were on the playground. This one, we're under a pavilion. Um, and it's just a really great way to have the kids do something different um, since they've been doing the red bags, you know, taking it home, doing the rotation on a regular basis um, and having it a, a special event. Um, the one in the bottom that the woman sitting, she's actually at the bottom kind of got cut off, but the picture is she's waiting as parents coming and that that site had little muffins as families came in and then they could do library card sign up. So it was a really great parent engagement piece around the blue bag event as well. Could you go to the next slide? All right, so um, collaborating with libraries. Uh, this is uh, the meat of what you know, it's telling you about what we've done. So we'll see, I want to help you build your relationship with your local libraries as well. Could you go to the next? Oh, just we'll skip this because we're getting tight on time. Okay, so how, what are some ways we could um, build a library connection? So um, there were two ways I was thinking. So there's the classroom connection of how we can support the classroom. And then there's also the community co connection. So in the classroom, we can reach out to librarians to help extend lesson plans, get books to meet certain topics. Um, libraries have, uh, you know, depending on your local library, you might need to check in and see if you can share, but they could have um, puppets, music instruments, uh, props to go with stories, felt boards. There's a variety of things that you could check and reserve and borrow for events. So that's a, a lovely thing that you can bring the library into the class. Um, on the community side, librarians can provide diverse collection of materials. So our local library provides, um, we reserved it several times, a popcorn machine. You know, so, you, you know, those are things that we don't have to buy for events. We just reserve it. Um, tents. Uh, we have um, chairs and tables that we've used for many, many events that we have reserved and worked through the library. So like when you're setting up a special event, think about the resources that are there. You don't have to go out and buy things. Several libraries have like lawn, lawn, um, lawn games or Jenga or whatnot, those different outs of cornhole 
you know, so if you're having a family event, check with the library and see what they have to offer. Um, the other thing that libraries um, offer as well are those um, discovery packs or specialized um you know, book packs um, that you can definitely make sure your families are aware that those are offered. I think that ours had something like a, a, a bird hunting and you could borrow binoculars. So there's all these great family engagement pieces. So don't forget that those are there. Um, another one is um, we, we just found out that the one that provides a, a wireless router and you can borrow it for up to a week. So it's amazing programs that are out there just to take advantage of. Um, then also in the community, they, there's um, mobile units. I think Rebecca mentioned like that there was one in Maryland. We have Bookmobile um, that goes around in different community events and then also the story times that are offered. Would you go to the next slide? All right, so these are some of my brainstormings of how you could build um, partnerships with your library. So our first step, and I've done this uh, many times, is walk into the library, maybe set up a meeting and introduce yourself, bring your information of your program, you know, if it's sharing um, Dolly Parton Imagination Library, if it's just building a connection for raising reader blue bag events, whatever your programs are, bring it with you so then they can have a copy note and see what you're doing. And then also check with them about programs that might work for early childhood families um, that you could share it with your implementers or, you know, email or even share Facebook pages. Um, so I've had this in the past where I sent out an inquiry to a library and I heard nothing back. <laughs> then somebody else from our organization said it and, and again, you know, a few months later, and now we're having a great response. So don't be afraid if the first time you tried to reach out to your local library or your librarian, if, you know, it fell to the bottom of the inbox, you know, try again. You know, it could be something that you need to go in in person and set it up as well. Um, another part that um, I wanted to mention on that is uh, one of our local librarians is, a, I guess you'd say, like not as technological. Um, so finding out what works best for them. They do a lot better with telephone calls and in-person meetings. So the email I was trying to do fell flat. So that could also be a different, you know, just to mark down what works best. Um, a big part of I'm noticing with a lot of libraries is if we can, if we can share their events out with families and families can take advantage of it and then they'll also share ours. So that's a big partnership, you know, um, in through email, social media, newsletters, all of those great events. Um, a big thing that uh, when working with the libraries, if you could co-host an event. So for us, we, we've co-hosted um, family literacy days. Um, we've invited libraries to come to uh, our special event days. Um, you know, even uh, we have an upcoming um, uh, book club and we're having the library and come to that as well. And we're, we're each taking a different day to lead. So if you can co-host events and then you build those relationships, guess what? They're going to think about you in the future and be like, Hey, it was really great. You know, doing that event, what else could we do? So keeping that fresh, um, as I, I mentioned it before, Due to COVID, so many librarians lost their connection with the classroom sites, lost their story times. So we've had um, a lot of people with um, staffing changeover, somebody's new at this place, that kind of thing. So reconnecting them or first time connecting them to your partner sites, to your implementers is huge. Um, and and just building those relationships so then the librarians can be a part of it. Um, our, a lot of our local librarians are also going to be under construction because they're old outdated facilities. So what we have librarians looking for places to um, do story time looking. So be that place, you know, have them set up that connection. Um, and then I have here be the connection. <laughs> um, so, you know, we all have the same goals of working with early literacy and helping um, build these great reading habits for the kids moving into elementary school. So, you know, keep working together, keep the conversation going. Could you do the next slide? Okay. so. These are a couple of my tips that I thought of, of how, you know, so you have this great event and you have this great meeting. How do you keep it going? Um, so one of the ideas was to research or ask the librarian if there's any early literacy councils or advisory boards that maybe you could be a part of or get the minutes, um, you know, and, and ask and see how that would um, help keep you connected in your area. Um, if you haven't heard from a library in a while, set up a time and check in, stop by. 
you know, nothing beats a hello. Um, so definitely um, follow up. Um, seasonal planning. So we're coming up into the summer season. Um, so I'm definitely reaching out to our local librarians to see if they have their summer camp information. Um, when I'm doing my blue bag events, I love to try to put that information in there or their newsletter um, so that we can help them keep connected with the families, even though the school year is over. Um, and then building on to the summer, I'm sorry, into the fall of what events are upcoming. Um, ask for upcoming event flyers. Um, ask to be added to the library, the library's newsletter. Sometimes it's just online. I had a, a, a librarian who we don't connect well and see all the time. Um, she emailed me. She said, thanks for posting our events. I really want to try to get as many families and that really helps. You know, so like just having that little bridge that we share their information and they share our information. Um, and then um, one thing that is a big part is if someone's coming to you and they're looking for resources, don't be afraid to say, hey, have you checked out the local library? Refer them. Um, for us, the library is about a mile from our office. So we can often say, hey, if you just go up the hill, it's right there. And they might be able to help you find more information. So don't be afraid to be that reference um, suggesting the library. Would you go to the next slide? Um, so these are some of the events that we've done in the past that I thought I'd share with you. I love these superheroes. This was from a summer um, library day that we had the kids come and they had the book fair. This is actually right outside the library. It was a beautiful day, so we were outside and inside. Um, but we have several ideas. Fall Family Library Day, we, um, where we encourage families of our implementer sites to go to the library um, and then to hear story time, to experience it, get library card signups. Um, we had um, encourage our implementer sites with school age children um, that they did a field trip to the library over the summer. We've had um, librarians invited to story time in the garden and we invited families to that. So they had that connection. Um, hosting teacher workshops. As I said, we um, have for teacher um, continuing ed. So if you can uh, find a connection or a librarian that would help you form that workshop to get teachers in the library, then if teachers learn about the resources, they can share it with families um, and tons more and more. I know we're getting close to the end. <laughs> um, could you just, I'll just share a few more and then we'll be there. <laughs> All right, so these are some of the, um, uh, we had uh, some, some um, this is a school age group in the library. And then the one out is, again, we were doing a build your own uh, story web. And so we were throwing yarn around the outside of the library. So it was great. Could you hit the next? <laughs> All right, so these are some of the great library connections we did. So we worked with a first grade group and they were um, at the library doing scavenger hunt. Um, so we had different things hidden. So they had a... Um, you know, find, it wasn't, we didn't hide things, I'm sorry. They had to find different places in the library, like the book return, the key to the restroom, the um, the new books, you know, the, the large uh, teacher books. So we had the kids taking over the library and trying to find everything. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is um, we had this story time at the laundromat. We're currently working with a site who is reach going to where parents are. So she's actually using our... Um, uh, family space in our local uh, laundromat and holding story times there now because she's trying to find where the families are and she thought maybe we can get the little ones at the laundromat. So how great is that that she's using our space as as another resource? So we're excited about that. Could you go to the next? Um, this is more pictures I had mentioned about story time at the garden. We, this is actually one of our local um, politicians um, who, who actually came to the event and we had worked at the library. And this is a community garden um, just down two blocks from where our new um, bookstore is, um, but connecting it back to the community. The, we have the library there, the um, family center, the, the local garden who built all these lovely um, flower beds. It was a great event. But just thinking outside the box that it doesn't always have to be an inside event. Next one. All right. And then this is my uh, last event. So we actually have now, this will be our third year doing, we call it Braddock Literacy Day. And this is our big event where we connect with the libraries, um, our implementer sites, um, and our early literacy community council to put on our book fair for kids. We have different 
readers come and they have um, the kids get to go through tents and listen to stories. This year's theme is going to be music. So we're really excited to have uh, performers come as well. So um, thanks so much. I know it's 2.59. So the last slide just has my email and everything in case you would like to hear some more of our um, information about all the stuff we're doing. So sorry if I went a little long, Rebecca. That, no, that's perfect. That's what we're here for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Megan? Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer. Hi, Megan. I loved your presentation. Thank you so much. And I especially loved all of your creative ideas of having outdoor celebrations and gatherings for the library. Um, so, and, and I also really like the idea that you use Pete the Cat goes to the library and give oh, those yeah. out to the children before going to the library. Um, and I thought, well, I can't afford to do that for all the children, but I could, I could maybe um, give it to the teachers so they could do a read aloud. And, and I was wondering know, read, what other exactly. books do you use besides Pete the Cat? And um, you have the bilingual ones. Um, the Pete the Cat one, I felt relayed the bit like an authentic like walking to the library experience because he gets his card and it you can you know he goes into the children's section so i i like that one um we we've, we've used the library lion last year um and sent that home um i can let you know um our librarian kathy she is um currently researching um some what what this year's book will be sometimes it just depends on what is on sale um to be honest um but yes, well, we, I, I, I think that um, the, if you can find, I know right now I, I'm, my brain isn't thinking of all the titles, but um, if you want, if you want to email me, Jennifer, I could ask Kathy, which ones were, what she's researching right now. Um, but uh, I think the ones that just connect going to the library and that experience um, are, per, are perfect. And it doesn't even have to, you know, just like, um, encouraging that keep going there oh someone just said the book hog is a good one i haven't read that one all right thank you so much great ideas thank you hey, any other questions for megan okay i know some folks have to leave i did put megan's email in the chat and Megan was open to getting emails. Uh, and I will include her slides in the presentation when we send out the post um, town hall recording. We'll put all of the slides together in a PDF so that way you have all of them. But I encourage you to go to Reading Ready Pittsburgh's website so you can see all of their spaces and all of the information. So if you do need to leave, please go ahead. But if you can stay on, we do have some announcements. Um, we have some information about digital retrospective parent surveys. So I know many of you have been waiting a long time for this. We have an upcoming Lunch and Learn next Friday. So this is 11 a.m. Pacific time. So those of you on the East Coast, this is 2 p.m. Uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific. So the Zoom link is here. This will be in um, this will be in the bookmark. Well, the bookmark comes out in April. So this will be in the follow-up email. This will also be sent via eblast. So if you don't catch this um, right now, you can email us at the hello at raisingareader.org if you would like to participate. So just remember this is 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time next Friday. And this is to learn about digital retrospective parent surveys. So we're going out with the pencil paper, in with the digital by popular demand and by entering 21st century life. Um, but we are also understanding if you, you know, need to use the pencil paper this year, absolutely. But we are also trying to phase into getting digital. So also the checkout surveys. So if you remember, we've been doing the check-in survey for so long in the fall, asking about the previous school year or program year. And it's hard to remember in October and November what happened the last September to May. So our checkout survey will start to be available in mid-April, around April 16th, um, and we'll, we'll ask it to be completed by mid-May or so. So it's going to ask you about family demographic information, but we will have a pre-checkout worksheet so you, that you know all the questions that we're going to ask 
It will not be 60 questions anymore. It is a much more condensed version. So the worksheet, uh, the pre-checkout survey worksheet will be available in that bookmark. Um, if you don't get the bookmark, make sure you're emailing us at hello at raisingareader.org so we can make sure that you are in the system, um, that you're in, excuse me, that you're in our database and uh, that we work out any quirks to see why you're not getting it. Our next town hall is our kickoff to summer on April 26th. So make sure you are registered for it. Um, everyone knows where to go to register for it, but hello at raisingareader.org, or you can go onto the online affiliate network to make sure you're registered and learn everything about summer, but you don't have to wait. Summer is available year round on the shop site, or you can email us at the hello inquiry or email your portfolio manager. So again, it's available now. You don't have to wait. So it's never too early to think about summer and get those super summer learning kits before the demand is just before the demand starts uh, just mounting as, as it will starting around April. So just a reminder, these are all of the things that you get in those super summer learning adventures packs. They start at age pre-K. So we're like late threes, early fours and goes up to second grade. And we've got beautiful books this year from um, that are coming in from the Diverse Book Coalition. They are beautiful bilingual books that are very diverse and rich. Um, our bilingual guide, our magazines, the crayons, the magnetic letters and numbers, the county cubes, and our fun navy blue drawstring backpack. So we'll be talking, we'll be diving deep into that next month and talking all about summer and all, all the fun. If you didn't get uh, all of our different uh, from the desk of Michelle Torgerson's this week, we have released our updated exceptional diversity book collection in honor of Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. We are so excited about this book collection. There is a 10 book collection for our zero to pre-K kiddos and our 10 book collection for school age kiddos. And this is these are collections that feature protagonists with various disabilities. And we wanna lift these um, books up to just feature, these are protagonists that do everything, that do anything and help children who have disabilities just celebrate themselves and also help start conversations for all children. These books come with book plates uh, that help stimulate conversations. There are videos that um, help parents who have children with disabilities help to understand that uh, with shared reading strategies that help them understand that, gosh, sometimes when after the doctor's appointments and after the medications and after all of this, it's still so important. Sometimes we forget as, as, as a mom with children with multiple health, health needs and disabilities, at the end of the day, our children still love to have that shared reading experience and still can experience that love and joy. So this is a school age. I shared the uh, zero to pre-K and these are just beautiful books and I would love to tell you all about them, but time is short. So we will have a separate webinar just about exceptional diversity, and you will hear me gush all about these titles. Have you heard the 2024 Refresher Collection will be coming to a product catalog soon, starting in summer of 2024, but you didn't hear it here. So these are previews of some of the titles that may or may not be part of the Refresher Collection zero to two, ages three to four, pre-K and kindergarten through second. So these, if you don't know what a refresher collection is, these are brand new titles to the Raising Reader collection. They come in sets of five with a red book bag and tag. They're all new titles to ensure no duplication and they are just meant to refresh your current collection. So we are super excited. A lot of bilingual new titles, a lot of STEAM titles, a lot of social emotional titles, a lot of award-winning titles, but I have to flip through this so you can't see too much of the new titles in the refresher collection. So start looking for this late spring, very early summer, 2024. And we have an updated product catalog. So if you haven't seen it, this is on our main website and this is a flip. So you can actually bookmark this um, bookmark this link and it is a live link. You don't have to get a new link every time we update the catalog. So it's very exciting. It's by popular request. Bookmark the link um, and you don't have to have a PDF every time you want it or you don't have to request it from your portfolio manager. Okay, one more announcement, two more maybe. 
coordinator training is coming. Our quarter two coordinator training is starting on eight, the week of April 8th. So sign up, get other people from your organization signed up, especially if you're the only one from your organization. Make sure someone else is registered for coordinator training so that they can help you. They can help you implement the program and you have a colleague. Okay. I know we don't have a lot of time for questions and discussion, but our PMP team, our programs and partnerships team will stay on as everyone is leaving in case you have a specific question or something to discuss with us. But thank you all for joining us. I realize we are 10 minutes over and we are so excited to see you next month in April as we kick off summer and we will be well into spring and nice warm weather all over by then. So thank you all for joining us and we are excited to uh, see you next month. Have a great weekend, everyone.